All right, we're going to go through an examination of the elbow. Again, anytime you're examining the hand, um, it's, it's critically important to follow uh, the hand up to the elbow because, of course, all the muscles are in the form and many of them insert around the uh, elbow region, region, and you need to examine that whenever you're dealing with pain or problems about the hand. So, um, st uh, examination of the elbow uh, begins with an examination of range of motion. And it's not just flexion and extension, but, of course, that's important. So you ask the patient to actively flex and extend and look not only for their ability to come to zero, but any ability to hyperextend at the elbow. That might indicate some degree of ligamentous laxity. Of course, in women, it's uh, usual that they will have some degree of hyperextension at the elbow. And then look at the overall alignment. You should have normal degree of cubitus valgus in extension. All right? And then you can quickly do an assessment of uh, stability. And what I'm doing is stabilizing the humerus best I can by grasping the epicondyles and then applying a valgus load to the elbow and seeing whether I can open the elbow up at all. This is very hard to do, actually, and hard to appreciate it. And I've got my fingers right over the uh, joint line on the medial side to see if I can feel any gapping. Again, hard to do. Why? Because the humerus tends to rotate. And at one extreme, I could let the humerus rotate, and it would appear that I'm picking up a high degree of valgus instability when, in fact, her arm is very stable. So do the best you can to stabilize that humerus and feel for any clunking or any gapping that's occurring. You can do it in full extension. Then you have some degree of mechanical interlock at the olecranon, which is preventing you from appreciating any instability that might occur, and then partial flexion. You then want to do the same thing by stabilizing the humerus and giving a varus test, and feeling again as to whether or not you have any opening on the, on the lateral side. Um, the next important part of a stability examination is called a pivot shift exam, or a pivot shift test. And what you're doing is stressing the posterior lateral ligaments of the elbow, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which goes from the lateral pecondyle to the ulna and stabilizes the entire lateral side of the elbow and, in fact, is one of the prime stabilizers of the elbow itself. So what I'm going to ask Joy to do here is to lay down, and I'm going to bring the arm up, and I'm going to ask her to relax best she can. And I'm going to just take the arm through a couple flexion extension cycles get a feeling for how easily it's moving, any locking, any catching, any loose body uh, palpation. And then I'm going to put her into a little bit of a valgus load as I do that. Again, the same thing. If she's starting to feel apprehensive about this, that's a good sign that she actually does have instability of the elbow. But if it's just moving normally, she's probably okay. The same time now, I'm doing forced supination. So you, be, you end by valgus load, supinating, and extending. And what actually would happen in an unstable elbow is the radial head would subluxate out and posterior at this point in time. As I then allow the elbow to flex, you'd feel a clunk as it popped back in. Obviously, this is, Joy has a stable elbow, and we're not picking up any instability here, but that's a test. Most patients who have an unstable elbow won't allow you to do that uh, because it's painful and because they hate that feeling of it popping out. In that case, you have two choices. You can put a, um, a diagnostic or actually a therapeutic injection of lidocaine into the uh, posterior soft spot between the uh, epicondyle, the olecranon, and the radial head. You can put about ten, 5 to 10 cc's of lidocaine in here and repeat your exam, or you can do it alternatively under anesthesia. All right, next is where I'm going to exam for very common conditions about the elbow, uh, tennis elbow and golfer's elbow, so-called lateral, uh, those are the common terms, but we know them as lateral epicondylitis and medial epicondylitis. Lateral epicondylitis, of course, is um, irritation, inflammation, stretch injury to the extensor muscles of the forearm, which begin on the lateral pecondyle. We don't really understand the pathology very well, but again, it's one of the most important and one of the most common uh, conditions that we treat. So again, you begin by looking at the arm. Sometimes you'll see a little defect here where, patient, where other physicians may have injected or perhaps you've injected uh, corticosteroid injections. Be careful with corticosteroid injections. One or two is the max, particularly for such a subcutaneous location. As you get into three, four, five, you may introduce uh, severe subcutaneous atrophy, skin depigmentation, etc. That can be a real uh, compounding problem for a condition like lateral epicondylitis. So look to see, first of all, if there's any, anything that's uh, grossly visual. Begin by simple palpation over the lateral epicondyle. I like to look just anterior to the lateral epicondyle where our extensor carpi uh, brevis inserts. That's the prime pathologic source or etiologic source of uh, lateral epicondylitis. So I'm going to palpate over the epicondyle and roll my thumb forward and see if that produces any discomfort. At this point, I'm going to ask the patient to extend their wrist. You can see the extensor carpi brevis right here. Extensor carpi longus is right in front of it, and there's a groove here. Go ahead and resist. 
And that groove can be demonstrated right in here. Okay, that's, that's the extensor brevis. I'm going to ask her to push hard against my resistance. And if that produces pain, that's a good bet that she has some irritation of the extensor brevis origin. That's with the elbow flexed. This is a two-joint muscle. It begins above the elbow and inserts below the wrist. I've relaxed the elbow while I'm tensing the wrist. What I can do now is extend the elbow, relax, let your elbow extend. I'm now extending the elbow fully, stretching the muscle, and now asking her to hold her wrist back and again resisting it. Even if a patient's not tender with the elbow flex, they generally will be painful with the elbow extended if they have lateral pecondylitis. You want to discriminate that from posterior interosseous nerve entrapment, which is a rare, actually a very rare condition. Posterior interosseous nerve, as you know, comes down, splits from the uh, radial nerve proper. The radial sensory component continues on the uh, radial side of the forearm. The posterior interosseous nerve splits through the supinator and then comes out into the forearm and gives innervation to all the forearm muscles, including the uh, digital extensors, the extensor carpial narus, the extensor indicis proprius, and the uh, extensor digiti minimi. Generally, patients won't have pain at the lateral epicondyle, but in fact, about three finger breaths distal to the lateral epicondyle, right here, which is actually about two finger breaths distal to the radial head, right where the supinator crosses the radial head. At that point, the posterior nerve is within millimeters of the radial neck itself. And if you put pressure, particularly over someone who's thin, put pressure right over the supinator on an irritated posterior nerve, it will be quite painful to the patient. The other way to bring that out is to ask the patient to supinate their arm against resistance. Go ahead, supinate, I'm resisting. That's compressing the supinator muscle around the posterior nerve and like a, a vice is pushing on an already irritated and inflamed nerve. That'll bring that out. Now, what you see is I'm resisting her at the wrist level. That's gonna uh, possibly confound your exam. Why? Well, because she can't supinate against my resistance, she's going to recruit her wrist extensors. If she has tennis elbow, this is now going to become painful, and you're going to be led down the garden path of thinking someone has posterior neurosis neuritis when they don't. So resist that, come back here, and resist the supination from this point here, letting her wrist do whatever she wants or encouraging her to let the wrist just go while she does that. Really isolate the supinator. That's an important part. You can do pronation against resistance at this point in time. Go ahead and pronate, and I'm going to resist her. Okay, that's testing more the pronator. And, um, and so you can do a lot of different tests with the arm in one position. How will that help you? Well, if a patient is, is sort of has a positive physical exam, everything hurts, and or they've been coached by someone or somehow to try to reproduce symptoms when in fact they may not really have it, by mixing up your exam and not only examining for one disorder at a time will help you sort out some of the confounding issues, such that if patient were complaining about both resisted supination and resisted pronation, that should send up a red flag and indicate that maybe they're volunteering some problems that aren't really existing. So I find that helpful in terms of discriminating upper extremity pain, and, and particularly when someone says it hurts from, you know, from here to here, that's a problem. When someone comes in and pinpoints, that's the site of my pain, you know, that's a beautiful thing, because then you can really hone in on problems that would, would result in pain here. But when you get the circle sign, it sort of hurts in here, or it hurts up here, or it hurts here, you know, all bets are off, and it, it's important to you to examine the entire upper extremity. You can't just assume that someone doesn't have something going on. You really have to rule it out and only resort to a pain diagnosis when you've ruled out all other conditions that could be potentially producing their discomfort. Needle epicondylitis, another important diagnosis. Again, uh, so-called golfer's elbow. Uh, again, you want to test for any instability. The tenderness now is going to be just anterior to the medial epicondyle, not over the ulnar nerve, just anterior to it at the origin of the flexor pronator wad, which is between my two fingers. Pronator, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris, flexor carpi ulnaris, the big four uh, muscles of the uh, forearm. Tenderness is right there. The irritated muscle this time is the pronator. So in addition to tenderness, I'm going to ask the patient to forcibly pronate the wrist against resistance. Go ahead and see whether that's painful. Here you can see the pronator standing out perfectly. That would be very painful in someone with a golfer's elbow. And then the next thing to do is ask them to flex their wrist against resistance. Go ahead. I don't generally find that causes pain, even in flexor pronator uh, tendinopathy or a golfer's elbow. And then lastly, bending the fingers down against resistance. I do that, but again, I shouldn't be causing a lot of pain. It's really isolated to that pronator. If you have a patient that you suspect meet epicondylitis without pronator-induced pain, it's probably not the right diagnosis. All right, moving on with our elbow exam. Coming to the medial side, what are the structures? Of course, the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve is entrapped below the epicondyle and the olecranon through a very small tunnel, which we call the cubital tunnel. Um, 
it's normally a little irritable, and if I tap on that, I'm probably going to elicit a little bit of discomfort or a little tingling in the fingers. Yes? No? Okay. And as I ask her to bend her elbow, I'm actually feeling that ulnar nerve in the groove and making sure that it stays in the groove and doesn't flip in and out and over the epicondyle. And particularly in an athlete, if that ulnar nerve is popping out of the groove with every throw, with every basketball shot, that's going to be a very irritable nerve and it's going to be a problem uh, for her. Uh, so you're assessing for subluxation. And you can, of course, have um, congenital developmental subluxation or you can have post-traumatic subluxation. So an important part of the exam. Next thing I'm going to do is put a little compression on the nerve. I'm just taking my thumb and trying not to squeeze on any other areas that might be painful and putting a little pressure on the ulnar nerve as it comes through the cubital tunnel and as it comes down under Osborne's ligament, which is right here, about a centimeter distal to the epicondyle. And I'm now asking her to see if she has any paresthesias in the finger. Any tingling at all in the fingers? Okay. A normal nerve will not have any problem with this exam for 15 or 20 seconds. I then flex the elbow. Now I'm provoking this because the elbow <coughs> is stretching the ulnar nerve across the epicondyle. And you can actually see here, you can see her ulnar nerve. It's a little bit of a bulge there. I can put pressure directly over the ulnar nerve and see whether that causes any paresthesias in her hand. None? All right. Again, a sign of a normal nerve. Bringing out paresthesias in this situation, though, doesn't necessarily mean that a patient has ulnar nerve entrapment. It will add to your suspicion of ulnar nerve entrapment, but of course, I'm essentially cutting off the blood supply to her forearm in this position as well. It may just be an ischemic result, so be careful with that. Moving down the forearm further, anterior osseous nerve splits off the median nerve here to innervate our flexor pollicis longus and our profundus of the index finger, as well as the small pronator down here at the wrist. It's going to split off right here. It's going to go through the pronator and then under the sublimus arcade at this level. Simple pressure over the sublimus arcade at that level may bring out pain in the forearm in someone who has anterior interosseous nerve or pronator syndrome. All right, it may bring out pain in this area. Classically speaking, pronator syndrome is a painful condition, sometimes associated with paresthesias about the base of the thumb where your cutaneous branch of the median nerve comes out. Anterior interosseous nerve characteristically is a little bit further down and it's all motor. It's loss of the flexor pollicis longus, loss of the index profundus, and, and loss of the pronator. So by putting pressure over the nerve at this level, you may, again, elicit some pain. But be careful with this. If a patient starts describing paresthesias in their median nerve distribution, be sure that you're not cutting off their uh, blood supply to the arm. You may be putting enough pressure on the radial artery that, again, you're inducing an ischemic neuritis. So I often mo will monitor my radial pulse when I'm doing this. Any tingling, any numbness, any pain? Normal median nerve. All right, moving back down the forearm, again, uh, any obvious atrophy, atrophy thenars, atrophy of the hypothenar should be examined at this point.